Hi, welcome to Behind the Badge. I'm Chief Alan Rodbell with Scottsdale Police Department, and with me is Ms. Chris Fasal, our community liaison. I like the miss part. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, thank you. Good, welcome back. Thanks. Yeah, to another episode. Another month. Yep, now we're right in, uh, this is uh, July. Correct. And so the summer's, uh, we're midway through summer. Can you believe half a year's gone? That, that part kind of gets me, because it's already a half, half a year. year already. But, uh, Six more months of Christmas, you better start that Christmas shopping. Yeah. And the good news is I can make an eight out of a seven pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> Making a seven out of a six was a challenge. <laughs> anyway, so what are we doing in Nothing. the summer? Everything is good. Just um, kids are, you know, out and about. Make sure you keep them uh, safe around pools and water and watch them when they're riding their bikes out on the street and just the, the normal things that we continually say, yeah. but because we continue as continually see tragedies yeah. so we just want to make sure that we just keep reminding people to keep an yeah. eye on your kids and we see that because people realize school's out so they don't really have the same attitude going to school zones as they should have mm -hmm. and kids are running across the street to their summer school camp sometimes in the school and clearly the playgrounds and so Absolutely. still need to be very very cautious and very very careful exactly yep. now citizens academy is almost filled up this next session it is i have all my applications but um again we have a spring session after that so if you really want to attend, just you know, get the application in because um, I, I hold them until I process them prior to the session and first come, first serve. Okay. And you might be really interested in this. We have some new furniture for you. So we're excited about that. We do. I've been <laughs> so excited about that. Oh, yeah. my goodness. So you might want to sign up just for that reason. Yes. Yeah. Our co community room chairs. has beautiful tables <laughs> now and beautiful chairs. And I'm going to try to get it painted. <laughs> and it's going to be beautiful. You've been working really hard on that. Yeah. So thank you for that. So, so happy. today's discussion is actually a very timely discussion uh, mm -hmm. about a topic that a lot of people have heard about. It's been in the news. It's a national issue. Yes. Lots of police departments or purchasing the technology. We've had it for a while. Some departments have had it for a while. Right. It's an ever-evolving technology, so there's been some, uh, there's been improvements over the years, and it'll be continue to be more improvements as time goes on, technology changing so rapidly. Yes. But we're talking about on-body cameras for police officers. Mm -hmm. And of course, cameras have been in law enforcement for a while. The old days, they were on the dashboard, mm -hmm. uh, which limited to how much real, um, uh, uh, of, the, of the event of you really could you record could because Correct. sometimes the things would occur just off to the right or off to the left of camera mm -hmm. and you really didn't could see. could hear something maybe but right. not necessarily see it. Yeah. It wasn't complete and we did try those cameras on the dash a long time ago but with 115 degrees they didn't they function, didn't function very well because of the heat here yeah. in Arizona. So we were really excited when the when the body camera technology came about mm -hmm. uh, to, to to start experimenting with it and see just how reliable it would be and how accurate it would be and what issues there were in terms of re retaining the data and being able to get the data when the data was needed. So yes. uh, we're well within the program. We have two people with us today that are responsible for the yes. Scottsdale program. The innovators of yeah. it. Would you mind introducing our guests? I would love to. Lieutenant uh, Larry Marmy is the commander of District 4. Executive officer for District 4. Correct. And Sergeant Reynolds, one of my Citizens Academy um, instructors as well, is here and he's in charge of the body cam. Very good. Welcome, gentlemen. Glad to have Thanks you guys you. here. You. So District 4 is located <laughs> where, Larry? We are the farthest north district um, in our city. We run from starting at Cactus north to the city limits, which is uh, about Desert Mountain, Cave Creek Road area and east to Bartlett Lake. So we are the largest geographic um, district or precinct um, within our department within our city yeah and so and so tell us a little bit about your career so i'm in my 23rd year believe it or not and um i've had a lot of fun exciting assignments over that time i've been uh, everything from a field training officer a uh, member of the swat team on both the tactical side as well as a crisis negotiator um, I've served in internal affairs as a sergeant. Um, I had a great assignment at our statewide training academy, um, training uh, young recruits from all over the state to be police officers. Um, then as a lieutenant, I have been in patrol and where I currently serve as the executive officer to our commander um, of the Foothills District. And what exactly is that position? Because we talk about executive officers, but the citizens may not be aware of that. Right, so the, our, our commander runs our district, um, is in charge of our district and reports to the assistant chief who reports to you, obviously. And I'm his, essentially his right-hand man. Um, a lot of community projects, a lot of outreach, um, a lot of administrative work, and I still have functional oversight of our um, day shift patrol officers for the area. Welcome. And I know you've been with us before, so welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Brian, you're uh, the, your first time here, yes, sir. Uh, and in this new position, you've been in this position how long? 
Uh, as a body camera administrator, I've been in this position for two years. Two years. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your background, please. Um, I've been a police officer for 21 years. Uh, this is my third department, actually. Uh, so I've got uh, some experience from outside the agency. I've been with Scottsdale Police now for nine years, which has been really rewarding. I've been a sergeant uh, in the patrol uh, section for the last three years. Um, so most of my career has been spent in patrol uh, as a patrol officer and patrol supervisor. I've spent a little bit of time in detectives and as a, a gang uh, enforcement officer uh, in a previous agency that I came from, Tucson Police Department. And then, as I said, the last two years I've been uh, uh, deep into this on-body camera program, which has been really, really interesting. And, and I which is so great because with all your patrol experience, since it's patrol, I mean, you've been in patrol long enough to know the, the disadvantages, advantages, and what is needed with that. So your expertise in that really helps in um, promoting the program and getting it done correctly. Yeah, it has been tremendously helpful in that respect. Absolutely. Great. Well, we're glad to have both of you here. So who wants to give me a little bit of a history of how we got to where we are today? I'll start. Um, so about three years ago, a little over three years ago, we started um, with a pilot program for body cameras, deciding which um, device are we going to use, which brand, which company. So we tested a few and um, uh, decided on the Axon at that time was a taser product, a body camera. And so we started with 10 cameras. And, um, you know, some departments across the country, as we started researching, we realized that they went with a full deployment right away. In other words, they would take however many officers they had in patrol and they would uh, distribute that many cameras and just do a complete rollout. Um, we thought it might be better for us to do kind of a measured rollout. Let's put some in the field. Let's test them. Let's see how they work. Let's see what works, what doesn't work. How do we improve on it? and then roll them out systematically after that. So we've been doing that now for, um, like I said, three years, and we are almost to the point of a full deployment. Um, we, we think we have most of the bugs worked out, and obviously there's a, a big financial impact when you roll all the body cameras out. And, and my understanding is the financial impact isn't necessarily the hardware, the equipment. It's really in keeping the data in the cloud where we presently keep it. Yeah, that's exactly right, Chief. Okay. Um, the, the camera cost, in, you know, as it relates to the data storage and all that, is, is minimal. Where, um, where we run into the financial impact is storing all of the videos and all of the data securely in the cloud. And, and we have to follow state law when it comes to the retention um, of this essentially evidence. The videos are evidence. And so we have to follow um, the state uh, records law when it comes to retaining those. And so some of them are retained. You may have hours and hours of videos that have to be retained indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And there is a, uh, a big financial cost to that. Plus the after effect of that, Chief, is not only does it have to be retained, you have to have somebody go in and redact it. Yeah, we'll so we have a whole other component right. on the other side of it as well. So there's a, people think, well, why is it so not so easy to put them out? Because it's a, it's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. So I thought we'd talk about that a little bit. I thought we'd talk about the advantages and some of the disadvantages and then where we're going with this. Because I'm sure the audience is very interested in knowing uh, a little bit more about the technology itself. So what do we see as the advantages of our officers wearing the cameras while they're interacting with the public? I think it promotes transparency. And in today's day and age, especially the, as technology continues to advance at the rapid rate that it does, uh, for one thing, the public expects that their police officers are going to be wearing cameras. And secondly, again, that, that transparency component, component is critical in showing the, the public that here's a, here's a video of what we're actually out there doing when we contact you. So to, to us, that's the, one of the biggest advantages of it is that we're able to show people who have questions about what we do and why we do what we do. Here's a video that shows exactly, or at least uh, a, a good picture of what happened. Um, and so in fact, we've used that to our advantage already. We have. A number times. of times when citizens might call and complain about how they were treated or spoken to, we literally can produce the, the video and look to see whether or not the officer's actions were appropriate within policy and, and accurately described. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes if it's not, we can, take, we can take corrective action. But oftentimes we find out just as when someone calls 911 and complains about a dispatcher, that's all recorded, oftentimes we can go right to that recording and say, here's the recording and as we listen to it, the dispatcher was very, very professional. And if not, we make, we make those corrections. Uh, so it is, there's, it's very uh, advantageous for us to be able to capture that contact when someone doesn't think they were treated fairly. 
Absolutely. And also allows us to look at the contact and see if our officers are doing the right thing. You know, when um, I think when some agencies across the country rolled out their body cameras, there may have been some thought of what are we going to see when when these when we start getting these recordings back? And um, we have had uh, none of those concerns. You know, we we are very proud of how highly trained our officers are and how professional that we expect them to be as leadership in our uh, department. And so we did not have that concern when we rolled them out. You know, what are we going to see from our officers? It, it has only served to um, to reinforce what we already knew is that we're not perfect, but but day in and day out, our officers do a really good job. Now, officers have to turn the cameras on at a certain time in in a transaction with citizens, and we have policy to that. Yes, sir. And what does that policy say? When should an officer have their camera on? Generally speaking, anytime they're engaged with the public in an official capacity, they need to be running the camera. So in a nutshell, that's when they should be recording. So as soon as they get out of the police car, once they say they're on a traffic stop, the first thing when they get out of the police car, obviously, besides putting in the information, would be to engage the camera. Correct. And there are certain times we tell them we don't want them recording. Absolutely. Obviously, personal moments private conversations with their supervisor or other employees? Correct. Okay. Sometimes, depending on the type of a call, if you're in a, uh, uh, a victim's home that's been burglarized, maybe, and um, you know they request that the camera not be on because maybe there are personal things in their house that they may not want to be a public record, there are times when we allow our officer's discretion to, um, to not have their uh, cameras running. And with certain victims? Yeah, yes. obviously juveniles. We're going to... Um, um, if they're recorded, it will be redacted, you know, should there be a public uh, information request for that. Um, uh, victims of, of certain types of crimes, maybe a sex crime or a family, you know, a child crime, um, there, there are very uh, specific instances when we would not. Yeah. Another advantage I've heard of is that when officers are confronted with someone who may want to be challenging to the officer, and when the officer lets them know that this is being recorded, it's really calmed the situation down pretty quick and actually avoided any kind of incident. Uh, are we seeing that evidence as well? We, we have. We're actually trying to capture data on that now as we speak, but we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that suggests, and we see this nationally also, uh, that when um, people know they're being recorded, they tend to act a little bit better maybe, and it can also be true for an officer. that They, they know that everything they're doing is being recorded, audio and, and video, and uh, I think everyone is, is aware. You know, it's interesting, but in today's world, I don't think you can go anywhere without being recorded. Wouldn't it be nice if people just behaved all the time because they're always <laughs> being recorded? But uh, every once in a while, you have to remind them. It's, sometimes it's yeah. so crazy when you look on YouTube and you see people fighting, and instead of people breaking up the fight, you see everybody pull up their yeah, iPhones and start phone, recording right? it. And yeah. it's like, well, let's like address the situation right. yeah. instead yeah. of recording it. So I, it has, you know, positives and negatives, of course. But I think it makes the, the public feel better, and I think uh, our agency is always, you know, toward the willingness of, of making sure our community is taken care of. Now, I also want to talk about the fact that it's not a, it's not a, um, plus, uh, it, it's not a, something that's going to take care of all the evils and all no. the ills in the world, having things on video. And we can expect too much from video and, and off time could be disappointed by mm -hmm. the, the times that it either officer forgets to turn it on, which there's a, there's a discipline that comes to that, corrective action comes as a result of that, uh, or the video itself does malfunctions, or there's an issue with, with uh, where the data is captured from. So what are those concerns and what are those shortcomings? Well, Chief, you, make, you bring up a good point, and that is that the public expectation a lot of times, I think, is that this is the easy button, that we put cameras on officers and it's going to capture every moment of every contact, and that's going to to fix any issue or question about how the officer performed, how the citizen reacted and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that there are disadvantages, one of which is the fact that the camera is nothing more than a lens that, that records what's in front of it. Body placement plays a big role in that. We presently have a combination of, of cameras, uh, some of which are mounted on the officer's chest, some others are out mounted on their shoulder or up on their head. So depending upon where it's mounted, it's going to dictate what is actually picked up during an encounter. Uh, that can be really important, especially when an officer is involved in a use of force encounter and split they may seconds. be split seconds uh, matter and placement matters. If we're involved in a very close contact conflict, 
the camera may just pick up, you know, what's directly in front of it, which isn't going to show them what actually occurred. Uh, so those concerns actually uh, are, are legitimate and they're real. Um, other concerns brought up are, are ones that you mentioned where, you know, officers in the heat of the moment may forget to uh, activate their camera. We, we never want all our officers to put themselves or anybody else in physical jeopardy uh, by turning a camera on when they should be focused on a threat that's in front of them. So those things do happen from time to time. Uh, as you also pointed out, sir, it's a piece of equipment, and like any equipment, it can and does fail from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, officers uh, go to turn the camera on and it doesn't turn on for whatever reason, or it shuts off on its own because of, of a malfunction, or uh, we've had instances plenty of times where the camera's been knocked off during a, a physical a altercation mm -hmm. or a scuffle with a citizen, so now it's sitting on the on the street somewhere and, and it's recording sky. So mm -hmm. all, all those things happen. And as you pointed out too, you know, we do hold our, our officers responsible for those actions that they have the control over. And so from our standpoint, it's we don't want to take punitive action for officers who have made a mistake uh, and, and did, did so without any malice. And, and that's from our from our experience, that's been the, the vast majority of cases where officers don't intentionally, from our experience, not turn a camera on when they know they're supposed to, but things happen and we, we tend Fastly, to... Fastly, quickly. Quickly. That's the problem. And we tend to... Quickly. We, we want to and we tend to use those as educational experiences for the officers so that they, they learn from that experience rather than making it a punitive uh, experience. You know, Chief, I, I think you say it best when um, what we hope never happens is that um, the camera will would ultimately take the place in a court of law uh, over an officer raising their hand uh, under oath and testifying to the truth of, of what happened. Mm -hmm. That's what we hope we never come to as a society. It's a great tool and one that we embrace and we use um, on a daily basis, but we never want it to take the place of an officer's word under oath. Right. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, one of the big issues facing this industry is the issue of redaction. And I know there's some companies that are working uh, as we speak and trying to develop the software that can do redaction intelligently, but also quickly. Because right now, really, we're literally going frame by frame by frame to make sure that the things that we can't release to the public, victims' faces, young children, social security numbers or addresses, by all, all there's a yeah, lot involved. There's a lot involved. Even dispatch, dispatching a call off the officer's radio because that's a different call, but we have to worry about that as well because mm -hmm. that's a privacy issue. Yeah, so there's a lot of, lot of issues facing this, and, and that's one of my other concerns is 100% is of all the rest will be on video one day, and many of those by multiple angles. Uh, the question is, all that has to be redacted. And so I don't know if you know where the industry's at with the redaction process, but that's a huge concern for us because the cost for that, going frame by frame by frame, are personnel costs, time costs, and eventually we'll have to have that in our budget to be able to afford to do it. So as, as we forecasted over the next 36 months, there will come a point when we will have to have um, probably a full-time employee that does redaction um, of these videos. And um, like you mentioned, we will have a call where there are four cameras on scene. Maybe the call only lasts 30 minutes. Um, but to redact those videos all, it could take hours, three or four hours. And, and, and they are, um, the, the, our office that does that now is, is going frame by frame by frame. And then once it's done, we then quality control it with another individual to make sure that we have redacted um, everything that we are required to, to redact. And as you see, uh, if, you, if you watch a newscast or some type of a, um, a movie or whatever where you see, re, you know, faces are blurred and they're walking off camera, the, the software is out there. It is really, really costly. And so um, we are catching up to that, but it is a big, um, a big time um, user for our employees. Yeah, to do it's that. An, this is a national issue for yeah. sure. And so, Brian, how much video do we produce on a daily basis? Oh, at this point, we've got roughly 140 cameras out on, on the street, so we're talking thousands. thousands of hours of video. On a daily basis. On a daily, on a daily basis, basis yeah. absolutely. And any one of those could be of interest to someone, either going to court or possibly yeah. just for any other contact it, with it, law enforcement, make a complaint, and literally we've got to go through the redaction process. There matters so, of public record, yeah. so at any yeah. time, like you point out, anybody can make a request for any video. Yeah. What we've done over the past year 
Um, you know, we are experiencing issues and growing pains as every department is. So we decided to form a um, essentially a, a committee of valley agencies that do what we do with body cameras, and we get together on a quarterly basis. And we've included partners such as the uh, Maricopa County Attorney's Office and some of our city prosecutors to um, talk about these issues and how do we streamline uh, process and, and make it more efficient. And so some of the successes that we've had creating that committee have been um, that we now, where we used to have to download a video and you burn it to a disc and you have to physically get it to you know, the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, we now have the ability to share via secure email all of this data. And it, it, it's been a tremendous success for our agency and for them receiving the evidence. So um, they're always, we're always trying to forecast what are the issues and how do we um, work through those. Yeah, I think our vendor recently had a, a tech conference and talk about the things that are up and coming in terms of you know, when the camera will turn itself on so officers don't have to consciously make the decision mm -hmm. to turn it on and turn it off. It actually works automatically with whatever actions or position that officer happens to be in. Uh, so whether they're exiting the car or drawing their, drawing their weapon. So th there's, there's gonna be a lot of new developments in this industry as time goes on. And, and I guess it's your responsibilities to kind of keep me advised of what direction travel we're going in and what we need to support and making well, us much more efficient. We've had great support from um, our leadership team, from, from you and the assistant chiefs and our commanders, um, have really allowed us the, the freedom and flexibility to, to branch out and, and try new things and see what works and see, you know, not be afraid to fail and try something new. And um, because this is ever evolving, it's changing daily. And I think uh, the public needs to be aware that it's not that we're trying to hide something, but everybody has the right to privacy. And it's, it's a fine line when everybody wants everything out there, but yet when it's them or their family member, they have rights, and then all of a sudden the, it, the, t the tables change and the tides turn, and they're like, well, why did you publish that? That's my private information. So it is a very fine line that we are trying to protect people's rights and still be open. And, and, and that's something that, depending on what side of the aisle you're on, or if you're a victim or a suspect, that could cause, you know, grief either way. So it is a fine line. There's a lot to consider. It's a balance. It's a balance and one that we um, work every day to make sure that we achieve that balance. Mm -hmm. What's our future uh, deployment strategy? With 140, not every officer in uniform has one. Correct. We have some specialized units out there. So uh, you guys have formulated our strategic thinking in terms of where we're going with this and, and what full deployment looks like for our organization. We have. So um, we are about to order 60 more cameras, which will take us to about 200, which will almost have us a full deployment. So um, that will happen in the next eight weeks. And then we'll have one more order probably six or eight months away. And that will, so within a, hopefully within 12 months, if everything goes as planned, we will be at full deployment, which means every patrol officer um, that um, is working the streets, is working a beat, um, will have a camera. And then we are starting to implement with some of our specialty units, also the canine unit, some, some members of the SWAT team. Um, so we're starting to go in those directions with the cameras also. And traffic. In traffic, all of our yes. all of our uh, motor officers um, have cameras. But we and don't have 144 people on the street at the same time. So <laughs> even if an officer doesn't have a camera that makes the stop, his his yeah. uh, backup might have a camera or somebody. Right. So it, I just want to make sure that the public is aware that you know just because we don't have full deployment of these cameras, that not every incident or things that need to be uh, recorded are not because oh, of absolutely. teamwork. Yes. So we just want to make sure that we're not saying, oh, we only have 100. 44 cameras. Oh no, but. we've had a number of incidents where the officer taking the action was it didn't have the camera, but the His backup backups. officer did. Mm -hmm. And although it's a little change in viewpoint, uh, at the very least you could see overall Correct. things that were mentioned in the report were accurately de depicted so, exactly. and captured. So absolutely, that's, that's true. It's a good chance with 144 or 140 and 200 eventually out there, someone on that scene, when you get more than one officer showing up, you're going to have a camera. We'll have multiple. And multiple, multiple views, yeah. Multiple views, mm -hmm. yeah. multiple views. And so, Brian, what are you doing in terms of like coordination? You're doing all the training and the and the refreshing training, and because we change equipment from time to time as well, it's been upgraded. We do. As a matter of fact, as the lieutenant pointed out, we're about to uh, get in uh, the newest um, version of Axon's camera, and so that will require uh, a wholesale exchange of the cameras that are out there. 
and training on that new product. So uh, I am in charge of that. Uh, I also maintain the equipment along with our IT department. Um, I make sure that officers understand the, the software portion of it, the, the evidence.com platform that they utilize to, to view their videos and to label them and so forth. So uh, primarily what I do is, is training along those lines and then also, again, keeping track of the inventory, making sure officers have what they need. Uh, like any piece of equipment, these things uh, break or they, they have issues and whatnot. So I make sure that the officers have whatever replacement parts they need as quickly as I can get it out to them. And I want to compliment you too and thank you because I also get the emails, but you keep it very pretty well appraised of some of the things that have been going on. If there's a nuance that occurs or an issue that comes up in terms of the docking or getting the information into the cloud needs to get there, you've been really good about giving those updates oh, and you. keeping people on track. And, and that's really important because an organization that's 24 7, you got to have a communication out there somehow where people are on top of the news and most what's most current with the technology we're using. And you've been great at that, so I want to thank you personally I'd for that. I'd like to brag on Sergeant Reynolds. He probably does the job right now that, that could take two or three people to do. I mean, it is in addition to he um, has you know control of a squad of patrol officers. This is an additional duty. This is not his only duty, and um, his email inbox. Is constant with um, questions. Hey, I, I have I a it. I have a cord that broke, or my battery needs replaced, or whatever it is, and getting that turnaround um, as quickly as we can, so we can keep the camera um, on the street, as well as he just mentioned on um, the the um, the package that we have with Axon now allows us every two years we can replace every camera. They're going to replace those for free, and so we're about to do a wholesale swap out of all of our cameras to the second generation or the next generation of cameras. So we're gonna, he's gonna have to touch every officer that has a camera to get it replaced and to make sure they're up to date with the training and the new technology and how it works and, uh, and all of that. So he does a great job. As, as a testament to that, I've been doing briefing visits. So I go around to all the briefings, 35, 40 briefings and office visits, and uh, there are no complaints. As I, as I ask them how things are going when it comes to this equipment, and, and your support. And so again, thank you both very much for being our, our yes, guest today. Yes, thank you for being our guest today. Uh, this thank is a you. really important current topic that citizens are questioning about, wondering about what are we doing mm -hmm. with this? And the opportunity to have you here and talking about this um, gives them a lot of information and, and, and clarity. So thank you so much for all you do Thanks on a regular having. basis. Thank and you. thank you for this. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Well, there's another, another month's shot, huh? Yes. As you say, it's almost Christmas. It's almost Christmas. Yes, Start so. Christmas shopping. <laughs> Sales will be beginning. Yeah, shop July, Scottsdale. July. Shop Scottsdale. Because in July, you know, like every other city across the country, when it's July, everything on the summer goes for sale and winter clothes come. But they forget that in Arizona, it's still 120 in September. So we have to have winter clothes in July. So just, just a tip. Okay, we got a shopper. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thanks a lot for being with us again this month and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. And uh, until then, be safe. Take thanks. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.